and it's given me terrible lighting really. Um, so just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, firstly, it's important to highlight that this session is being recorded. A little pop-up should have just appeared on your screen to give consent to this. Um, it will be uploaded onto our website for others to watch who are unable to join us today. Secondly, if you have any questions about the presentation, then please do type them in the chat box. Um, at the end of the presentation, I will invite the person to unmute and ask their question, although we might not have time for all questions. Thirdly, we have enabled the subtitles for the seminar. You can turn this function on should you require it at the, with the live transcription box at the bottom of the screen. And finally, can you please keep your cameras off and your microphones muted throughout the presentation? Once the presentation is over, however, it might be nice if you want to, to turn your cameras on so that the, the speaker can see everybody. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, Professor Meringox. Uh, and I'd particularly like to thank her because she's joining us um, at 5.30 in her time in the morning. <laughs> uh, Professor Gox is an award-winning researcher based in the University of Auckland in New Zealand, where she's a co-associate head of research. She directs the Te Arai Palliative Care End of Life Research Group, which she will tell us more about shortly. Her research interests include palliative and end of life care, participatory research, gender and equity. Marion, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. So if you'd like to uh, share your screen for the presentation and perhaps you could also briefly describe yourself and where you are. Okay, well, Morena Kato, um, from a very cold and dark New Zealand. Oh, I I'm can't hear you, Marin. Does Is anyone else having that? Okay, I'm not quite sure why that is. I'm not on mute. I can hear. Oh, I, can hear. <laughs> I can hear you as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So sorry, Nicola, I don't know why you can't hear, but it's obviously something your end, I'm afraid. Um, hopefully you can get that um, sorted out. Um, but yes, Morena, um, good morning, um, good evening to you. And I'd just like to begin by thanking Nicola very much for inviting me to speak to you, even though I had to set my alarm for 5.15 a.m. Um, it's always great to have an opportunity to talk about a topic which I feel so passionately about. Um, and thank you also to Nicola for introducing me to the idea of describing myself. Um, I think we're in the equity space, we're always learning. So that's um, a new learning for me. So I've got blonde hair, um, I'm white. Um, I'm sat in my um, sitting room in, in New Zealand. Um, I've got my dog behind me, but you can't, can't see her. Um, and I'm wearing um, a jumper that I've knitted myself. Um, for knitting fans out there, that's the Cipola pattern by Caitlin Hunter. Um, my Twitter fans will know that I got quite into knitting during, during lockdown. Um, so I'd also like to just say, if there's any issues with the technology, please do let me know, because it's great to have this opportunity to connect with you um, on the other side of the world, but it is quite a strange mode of presenting. I'm not sure I'll, I'll ever get quite used to it. So if there are any issues, please do let me know because I'd hate to get to the end and realize that the only person who'd been listening was my dog. And to be honest, she looks quite asleep and I'm not sure she's going to be listening. Um, so I'd like to just start by talking about myself. And that's not because it's something I feel particularly comfortable doing. Um, I did a PhD because I like sitting by myself in libraries and reading and I thought an academic career would provide a lot more opportunities to do that, um, but that has not turned out to be the case. But I think it's really important to, when we're talking about equity, to start with ourselves because we tend to start with the other, the disadvantaged, the marginalised, the vulnerable. Um, and in framing the issue like that, we put the problem onto other people. Um, and 
for those of us who have significant privilege, we fail to recognize this and we fail to see that we are part of a system um, which affords us privilege. So I think it's really important to start um, by thinking about ourselves. And that sort of approach is in line um, with the work of colleagues from the University of Auckland, such as Elena Curtis and colleagues. And I should say all the references are, are at the end of the presentation um, and they will be on our blog as well. But she talks about moving from cultural competence, which really has been around um, sort of learning the cultures of other people um, to cultural safety, which is really starting with ourselves. So in thinking about privilege, I thought I'd start with thinking about well, why, why on earth um, do people want to listen to what I've got to say? Um, and I suppose being a professor um, gives you some sort of social um, license really to, to make people think that you might have something that's worth sharing. I have to say, I'm not sure I've become more interesting since I've become a, a professor, um, but you know, there is that status attached to it. Um, and so it's interesting to reflect on sort of how my social position has supported me um, into that. So I think firstly, the fact that I am white has certainly um, been an advantage. So in Aotearoa, New Zealand, 85% of professors are, are white, um, despite the fact that really doesn't represent the demographics of the population. Um, and in particularly um, the obligations of of the government in relation to the Treaty of Waitangi and, and responsibility to Māori. Um, work by Tara McAllister and colleagues um, at the University of Auckland showed that actually only 2.6% of professors in New Zealand are Māori. Um, and Serena Napi um, also added to that um, by identifying that there's only actually five um, Pacific Island professors in the whole of the country, all of whom are men. Um, which brings in the issue of gender as well and, and reflecting on gender um, well being a woman hasn't helped my academic career um, only 25 percent of professors um, in Aotearoa New Zealand are women and over the course of our careers we earn on average four hundred thousand dollars less than men and two hundred thousand dollars less for doing the equivalent job but I'm a cis woman I use she her pronouns um, and that gives me a massive advantage over colleagues who are trans women. I don't know how many trans professors there are in the country, but um, my guess would be none. Um, there is um, a trans woman called Jan Eldridge, who's the head of our um, Department of Physics, who runs an amazing Twitter account, if you're interested. And she talks about um, what it means to be a trans woman working in academia and working in STEM. And when I see the amount of work that she does on top of her academic job, in terms of educating other people, in terms of being herself in her workplace, um, I reflect on the fact that that is really not something that I have to do. I think the other thing um, that I'm aware of is that as a white woman speaking into this space is much easier for me um, and doesn't open me up to the sort of um, discrimination and abuse actually that, that colleagues have received. So just last week, um, a colleague here, a Pacific Island academic, an amazing woman called Jemima Tiata, um, spoke about um, being a Pacific woman within academia, within um, a system that is really set up around Western valid values and, and prioritizing Western knowledges. And she received a, a horribly abusive message on her answer phone, um, which was incredibly racist from an older white New Zealand woman. Um, and, you know, I'm very aware that I haven't ever received um, any reactions like that. You know, I am met with disbelief sometimes, and I will talk a little bit to that, um, but I'm certainly um, not opening myself up to that sort of vulnerability. And that's something I think I need to be really aware of. So I moved um, to Aotearoa, New Zealand um, 11 years ago now. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite a long time. It's, it's amazing how quickly time, time passes. And when I moved to New Zealand, I, I thought I knew quite a lot about equity in research. Um, so my um, original undergraduate dissertation looked at how people with HIV and AIDS use primary care services in London. Um, I used to work in a hospice with children with HIV, which is how I got interested in palliative care in the first place, my PhD moved me into critical gerontology and I became really interested on the 
in the impact of ageism, particularly on end of life experience. Um, but really moving to New Zealand was a game changer for me in terms of how I understood what it means to work um, in, a, in an equity space. And I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues. Um, they, these are some of my colleagues from the TRI research group and particularly the wahini or, or woman um, on the left of your screen or maybe the right of your screen, sorry, it's a bit, it's a bit early, um, with a beautiful um, moko kawai tattoo, um, Dr. Tess Moike Maxwell. Um, she helped me co-found the TRI research group together with um, support from Komatua or Māori elders. Um, and our research group is, is a bit different in that we um, are set up along bicultural lines, which means that we recognize Māori knowledges, Māori ethical frameworks and um, Māori ways of seeing the world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and what that means as I go along. But crucially, we see that as a framework to support our work with everybody, not just with Māori. Um, and I hope as I talk, you will see how this approach can support work um, with other minoritized um, communities as well. And so if you want to learn more about our research, our research group, um, we've written a paper about that. And um, this is our, our new logo, and this kind of helps explain a little bit about our names. So on one side, we have the huia, which is an extinct um, New Zealand um, native bird. And the other side, we have the tui. Um, and in the middle, we have the marae or the Māori meeting house, and the arai is the veil, um, and that's both a, a physical space, so that's um, a space at the back of the marae where you put a dead body um, when, when the person has died, but it's also a metaphor for sort of the, the connection between this world and the next. The other thing to say is that moving to New Zealand really helped me see our health system in a different way, because what really struck me is I traveled for 24 hours to the other side of the world, um, and the health system and, and the hospices that I went to visit were just so similar, even though the cultural composition of the population was really different. So that just really made me reflect upon, certainly within the New Zealand context, how palliative care can be seen um, as a product of colonialism, really. Um, and that's not to say that there isn't excellent examples of care happening and excellent examples of very culturally appropriate care. And I'll speak to that a bit more in a minute. Um, and, and just to be clear, I, I don't think those two things are mutually incompatible. And I think um, people react to what I'm saying because they, they feel that they provide excellent and appropriate care. Um, but I think we really need to be critical of the systems that we work within. Um, and in this space, we always have to be critical of ourselves. So I'm drawing on a selection of studies while I speak. Um, and I could have spent you know, the whole presentation talking in depth about each of them. Um, but what I really wanted to do was to move from a situation where talking to equity, doing equity research is something that a handful of researchers, um, or probably a growing number of researchers are, are devoting a lot of their career to, to actually moving to a space where all palliative care researchers and all consumers of research see equity as absolutely fundamental to, to everything that we do. But I'd really like to acknowledge my colleagues. I'm really fortunate to work with some amazing people. Um, I'd like to shout out to Naomi Richards, um, who I think is online. I don't think any of my um, New Zealand colleagues are out of bed yet. Um, or Well, they might be out of bed, but I don't think they're, they're working. Um, but I would really like to acknowledge um, their work, but also say that this argument is, is mine entirely, um, drawing upon my experiences um, of, of working on a range of projects over a, a very considerable number of years now. So. These are the things I want to talk to. Um, I want to start off by talking about how I see palliative care being inequitable, um, giving examples from my research. Um, but I also want to move beyond that as well. Um, and I particularly want to sort of pause before thinking about what happens next. And I want to talk to the fact that I think there's a real need to actually stop and reflect before we think about how we move to promote equity. 
um, and I'm talking particularly into the research space because that, that's my area, um, but I think what I'm saying also has applicability to practice and policy as well. And then finally, as I said, I want to argue for a paradigm shift um, where we move to a situation where equity is routinely integrated into everything we do in research. So just to start off with some concepts um, very briefly, I'm sure this um, diagram will be really familiar to you. I haven't actually attributed it because I couldn't find an attribution um, when I was looking, um, but there's lots of different versions of this. Um, and it really talks to how we think differently about equality, equity, um, and you'll have seen in the title of my talk, I, I talked about social justice, which is one of the sort of defining um, values of, of the TRI research group. So in the first image, we're really talking about equality. So we're treating people as if they're the same. Equity is supporting people um, to have a more, um, to understanding they have different needs in terms of, of reaching that end point. And the third image around um, social justice is around actually removing the barriers. So there are very different ways about thinking about this in palliative care, but one way um, might be that um, in terms of equality, you open a hospice and you expect that everyone will be able to access it in the same way and that your marker of success is that that happens. In terms of equity, it might be that people are provided with special supports to access the hospice. The hospice does special things in recognition of the fact that not everybody has the same opportunities to access that service. And then the final image might be um, that actually you get rid of hospices um, and start from the beginning and ask a community, well, what, what does good end of life care look like for you? I'm not saying that I'm, I'm advocating that, but I'm just saying, you know, there is a continuum and certainly within New Zealand, there is um, a lot of movement and there's Māori um, operated and owned systems, including health systems. Um, so it's really interesting to think about that in relation to these sorts of concepts. The other thing I wanted to say was that I think language really matters in this space and I think it's it's difficult um, and we often get paralyzed by language often actually into in inaction because we're not sure what language to use. Um, but one thing I think is really important to recognize is that it's those with the greatest social power who define the other. Um, and what I think we really need to be moving towards particularly in research is making sure that those groups that we work with who um, have been minoritized um, by, by social structures, have um, some ability to actually define what that language looks like. So for example, the work we're doing in deprivation at the moment um, has been really interesting um, because we've got projects going in, in New Zealand led by Jackie Robinson and Scotland led by Naomi Richards. Um, and it's been really interesting using the word deprivation, which is a word we had to use for our funding to speak to other academics. Um, but actually that's had not much resonance, um, certainly in the New Zealand context with the people that we want to work with. There's actually, you know, people don't like that term at all. Um, and in Scotland, we found that what deprivation meant to us within the context of the project, which was really about the one in five um, households in the UK who are experiencing poverty, um, that that actually is not how the health professionals we've been working with have understood deprivation. And they've been thinking much more of people who are ex um, experiencing very extreme poverty um, and homelessness. So I think, you know, there's a real need while we um, move palliative care research more into the equity space that we think about language. I think the other thing that I just wanted to highlight is that um, a lot of the privilege that's inbuilt into our system is completely invisible. So Kelly Stadstuha did an um, amazing presentation at the Public Health Palliative Care Conference in Australia back in the days when we were allowed to, to travel. Um, and she talked about how privilege is as invisible as air unless you want to breathe. And, you know, I think one of the things that I've really tried to do through my research is to draw attention to where 
privileges inbuilt into the system, but that we just don't see it. And I'll talk a little bit more to that, but I think that's the other thing that we need to think about when we think about privilege. It's not just our own individual privilege, but it's that which has been inbuilt into the system um, in such a way that we just cannot see it, but that it's just seen as the right, the normal, the acceptable way to do things. And we've done a few analyses. I led a paper around gender, um, and we've also just finished a paper, which hopefully um, will be published soon around deprivation. Um, and sort of our conclusion from scoping out what's out there, um, and also from, from my research experiences over the years, has been that the imagined palliative care patient around whom policy is formulated, um, you know, lives in secure housing with family support, is white, middle class, and male. And I'll talk a little bit more to how that is embedded in our system, but um, I think that's inevitable because that's the society in which we live. Um, that is the norm against which everything else happens, um, but it's often very hard for us to see that. And this image actually is a really good example of that because I typed palliative care into Google, and this is one of the first images that came up. Okay, so the first um, thing I really wanted to talk about was about palliative care um, being inequitable. And there's been some really great work um, happening here, so I won't um, repeat that in too much detail. But I really just wanted to draw on my research to talk about inequities in terms of access, policy assumptions, and end of life experience. So I've done a lot of work that's shown that the there is inequities in access to services. Um, and this is just one example from Helen Butler, who works with the TRI Research Group, who found that people with serious and persistent mental illness are 3.5 times less likely to receive specialist palliative care compared to the general population. Um, in terms of access to generalist palliative care, we found, um, unsurprisingly, well, we know that there's a lot of evidence that the inverse care law operates within primary care. Um, and we've explored how that's extending into the end of life um, area. Um, and really that just means that the need for health service is in inversely, or sorry, the supply of health service is inversely related to need for health service. Um, there's also huge intersectionalities when you look at access to palliative care. And I think intersectionality is something we've always got to be thinking about. Um, and certainly we're doing work at the moment looking at access to GPs. Um, and we found that a very high proportion of people in Auckland aren't seeing their GP in their last year of life. And when we put that you know, into simple chi-squared type analyses, lots of things come up as significant. But when we start putting all those factors in, actually nothing comes up as significant. Um, and I think that is a real message in terms of thinking about the different axes of privilege and disadvantage which determine service access. I think there's also a real danger um, that we perpetuate inequities with some of the ideas we have around, um, as I said, um, sort of normalised palliative care. So Jackie Robinson's work on hospitals has been really interesting. She was actually the first person to look at what benefit people get from hospital at end of life because no one had asked the question before. And one of the things she found was that actually people who live in areas of deprivation experience more benefit from a hospital admission than people who live in more affluent areas. So in terms of things like promoting dying at home, um, that could actually further perpetuate inequities if people who live in, in areas of deprivation, um, and maybe in poor housing with struggling to access food, um, if they actually might prefer hospital admissions. So I think you know, that's something that, that we really need to be thinking about. It's interesting to think about the nature of end of life care. Um, Again, the gender analysis and the deprivation analysis found that certain groups um, are more likely to receive sort of what we call aggressive or um, more interventionist end of life care, things like um, chemotherapy at the end of life and so on. Um, and that includes people living in areas of deprivation, um, men and some racially minoritized groups as well. Um, and it's really interesting to think about how preference feeds into that, but also how 
particularly maybe for people who haven't experienced good access to services throughout their life, how maybe, um, you know, they're very concerned that they won't get the good care or the level of care that other people will. And so they, they you know, they ask for a, a particular level of care. But that's something that really needs further exploration. Um, policy assumptions and, and philosophies of care. I mean, I think there's, there's obviously been some really good work in this area. Um, Erica Bergstrom's work around choice, for example, and, and there's more people now sort of talking critically about home. Um, but I just wanted to share this quote from Margaret Mitchell, who's the photographer we're working with on the project in Scotland. Um, and she's, you know, already producing some amazing images in collaboration with, with people who are experiencing um, death within the context of poverty. And really, she talks to the fact that her work is hoping to problematize the idea of choice, um, as she says, to see that sometimes people choose something because they haven't been offered very much. We've also done work around advanced care planning and gender, um, looking at the fact that actually women often feel they have different choices to make than men around end of life because of um, sort of gendered assumptions around the nature of care, particularly for the current cohort of older people. And this image here is just of um, someone who's living in their car, um, you know, and within the context of, of homelessness, within vulnerably housed populations, what does dying at home mean? And certainly Kelly Stajduhar's work is really um, interesting in that context. And I know there's, there's other work, great work going on in, in that area as well. You can't really talk about equity without talking about um, racism. Um, and I'd really like to recognize the recent editorial um, by Jamila Hussain and colleagues in Palliative Medicine, which was great in um, starting to get us to think about this. I just wanted to reflect on this as something we have found in our own research with Māori in New Zealand. We found um, racism in terms of health professionals attitudes and behaviours. We found examples of Māori not being um, or not receiving appropriate treatment, for example, in terms of pain medication, because they are labelled as drug seeking. We've also found examples of people not being allowed to practice their traditional end of life care customs. For example, staff calling the police when um, a Fano family did a haka when someone had died. Um, and obviously all of this has got to be seen within the context of Maori traditional medicines having actually been banned under colonialism. So I know this is a, a difficult issue for many people to talk about, but this is the reality of the, of the um, sort of society within which we live. And certainly there's a lot of talk in New Zealand at the moment about the extent to which um, our public institutions are institutionally racist. So I'm hopefully um, getting you into a space of feeling that there is many inequities in terms of palliative care and that, you know, there's so much great work. I could have talked about this um, in, in great detail, but I'm aware that the time is, is already ticking on. Um, but I guess my key message at this point was that I think particularly those of us that work in palliative care were drawn to this area because we want to help. But I'd actually like to really caution that we um, reflect um, before we take action. And I just want to share with you um, some stories from work that, that we've recently completed. And this is led by my colleague, um, Tess Moiki Maxwell. And I'm gonna share some videos. So um, you'll have to bear with me in terms of the, the, the technology. I hope that's gonna work okay for us. So I think I have to share a different part of my screen now. Sorry, I have had a cup of tea, but I haven't had any coffee, so. Sorry, I'm trying to do this off my laptop and I cannot find my Zoom link. Just see if I play this 
whether you can see it or not. The gee doctor said to my father, you will only be alive for two months. Can you see that or is that? Sorry. Uh, no, we can't see it. No, I can hear oh. it, but I can't see it. Awesome. Awesome. Right. I just have to, <laughs> sorry, I have to work out. <laughs> okay. Right. I think, I think we might get there. Um, can you see it now? He needed to be hired yeah, for his family in his last days of care. I asked Dad, Dad, would you like to come home? And he replied to me, coming home to what? There's nobody here. And it was true. The house was a shell. There was no toilet. We had no water access and we had no power. We had a lot of work to do. I say we had to bring colour back into the house. We had to bring love, laughter, love and more family. I was reaching out to the family that I hadn't reached out to in years and they were coming and her coming so hard. It was amazing, overwhelmingly awesome. So that, that gravitational pull, that pull towards home took us back to dad, took me back to dad and dad took us back to our papakaina, back to Tati. So... That was us. We made our journey from Auckland to Titi, Monganui, uh, Ngāti Rehia. And going back to, to the Papakainga, just, just connected. It was that connection with everyone, everyone else's vital life forces which came in. It was a puna, a well that we could start accessing. Can we use your shower, your amenities? Yes, yes, was the doors were opening to us, which made this job of looking after our father so much more easy. Everyone knew, we all knew what our role was. We just jumped into the role and we just did what we needed to do to complete the jobs, our roles, but to uplift and to fucking run a dad. And I believe that being back home, that was the whole purpose of being back home, was that to uplift him the love between two daughters for our father, we gave him. I was blessed enough to be there to watch it unfold in front of me. Okay, so sorry for the slight technical glitch, um, but I wanted to, didn't want to start from the beginning. Um, <laughs> I might just have to quickly flick through, sorry. Obviously should have had more coffee before I started. Um, but I wanted to share that digital story with you because um, I think there's a real danger that we rush in and we try and fix other people. I think that's the real risk in the in the um, equity space. And that was a story taken from a project which was looking at Māori end of life care customs um, led by Tess. Um, and it came from our Komatua who were concerned that these customs were being lost. And that story could have been framed in lots of different ways. It could have been framed um, in terms of experiences of poverty um, at the end of life. It could have been framed in terms of um, racism. It could have, you know, there were lots of different framings it could have had, but actually the framing was positive. The framing was about the strengths of that community um, and the strengths of those um, daughters who created with support um, a very um, amazing end of life experience for the father that they loved. Um, and really to me that speaks to self-determination 
which I think has to be at the core of thinking about how we work um, with minoritized communities. Um, and this is a concept that's been talked about particularly in relation to indigenous people. And obviously it has a particular meaning within this context. Um, but I think it applies to other communities um, as well, that really we've got to make sure that we're always um, doing with and not doing to. And I'll, I'll speak a bit more about, about that as I finish. Um, but particularly, um, it's been interesting to see the talk around equity in relation to COVID, that um, we've talked a lot about how COVID has perpetuated inequities and made these visible. And absolutely, um, it's been hor horrible, horrific to see, um, but actually important to see. Um, but there's been less spoken about how the strengths of particular communities have come out and how people have self-mobilized in this space. And we've seen a lot of that in, in this country um, with the work that Māori have been doing to support their communities. So really my reflection would be um, that there is a danger um, and there is a history of white people in particular trying to go in um, to save other people. And I think there's a real need to critically reflect before we take action. And we need to always be thinking to self-determination. I wanted to finish by really talking about the fact that, you know, this is a, a space that we all have the opportunity to make a difference in whether we do research, and I'm gonna talk very briefly about how um, we can incorporate equity considerations into research, but also as consumers of research, when we use research, um, I think there's a, a need to be a lot more critical about some of the um, often overly simple messages that we put out and really um, think about whether um, equity is being, um, is being sort of visible in this work. I mean, the first thing to recognize obviously is that research has um, a huge colonial history um, and a very patriarchal history. Um, and I think that's particularly important to recognize when we try and work with communities. And sometimes we're a bit surprised that they don't wanna work with us. Um, but actually, you know, people have had really terrible experiences um, of, of working with researchers in the past. So I would really urge you to, to read some of this work if you're a researcher um, uh, and thinking about how your work could be more equitable. Um, certainly Linda Tuiwai Smith's book, um, Decolonizing Methodologies is, is important, whatever community you want to work with because it really makes visible some of the assumptions that, that we carry in our research, assumptions that very much come from a Western way of seeing the world and a majority dominant culture of seeing the world. Um, there's opportunities for us to think about equity, whatever research we do. And those of you that saw me speak at the EAPC will have heard me talk to um, some of these issues in relation to gender. And one of the most interesting things I found when I started looking at this was, you know, things even around what so-called basic research um, with animals that, that most of our work is done with male um, animal models. And that actually that means that um, this work is actually not transferable to women in the same way as it is transferable to men. And there's a, there's a big body of evidence coming out now to actually show that um, and to show that that's one of the reasons why women are more likely to have adverse um, reactions to prescriptions than men are. Randomized control trials. Um, we know that there's a lot of bias in terms of who gets into randomized control trials. Um, and again, we know there's reasons why particular communities would be very resistant to doing that. Um, but I think one of the really interesting examples in, in palliative care is the early integration of, of palliative care study by Temel, um, which obviously showed benefit and that's been hugely cited, talked about and so on. Um, but a secondary analysis actually found that that didn't hold either for women or for older people. And we don't talk about that. Um, so again, it's fascinating in terms of not just um, what research we do and, and who we work with, but then how we talk about that and how, you know, in the rush to try and simplify um, messages sometimes, or, or, you know, to, to get change, um, we, we erase some of that complexity that comes with really thinking about um, whether this actually does apply to everybody. 
we've been doing some work looking at family caregiving um, with my colleague um, Claire Gardner and we've got an EAPC task force now on the economics of family caregiving um, but a, a huge inequity that's being perpetuated in this area is not taking into account costs for family caregivers um, so, you know, if you're someone who's interested in health economics, this, this is a huge equity issue because we're really perpetuating inequity if we move forward without considering families as a key component of that economic system. Big data. Um, I'm aware I'm just, you know, I could have given a whole lecture on each of these topics because it's completely fascinating, but I really just wanted to um, to really raise, you know, across a range of, of, of methodologies, how we can be better at thinking about equity. Um, I think there's really interesting issues around big data. Certainly it's being talked a lot about here um, because we have a, a unique identifier. So we have the ability to match across many, many different data sets for the whole country. And there's questions being asked about, you know, just because we can do that, should we be doing that? Um, whose data is it? What role do Māori have in actually regulating their data? Um, and particularly as well in terms of the messages that come out of that data um, and you know, what benefit ultimately do the community who are being analysed um, have from that work? And again, something that's really important to think about and often we don't think about equity when we think about big de-identified data sets. Systematic reviews, um, you know, there's a proliferate, uh, I can't speak, proliferation of systematic reviews um, in palliative care, which is fantastic. You know, we need to keep collating our evidence. But I'm always surprised that they're often quite uncritical because I think this is a real opportunity that most of us have in our work to actually um, identify where there are gaps, where um, there are people who aren't being represented. And for example, there's been work done around sex and gender in systematic reviews. Um, showing that there is not adequate um, attention um, and there's an assumption that something would work the same for everybody. Um, qualitative research, again, I could speak for hours about this and then I've got colleagues on here who, who could speak for even longer about this. Um, but really in terms of who we work with, I still think um, there is a, a danger that, that um, Particularly, we talk with health professionals as a proxy for talking with, with people. And health professional attitudes are absolutely really important to explore. Um, but certainly when we did our recent review on deprivation, we actually found hardly any studies that actually quoted the lived experience of people living in deprivation themselves. And so it's really important that we start doing that work because other, otherwise we're just um, othering people all the time. Um, when I'm reviewing, um, studies I often and papers I often see people talk about you know purposive sampling for diversity but then not how that was taken into account um, in analysis I think there are issues around um, we use very traditional research methods which is like interviews and focus groups and you know and we do a lot of that I should say when I'm criticizing the discipline I'm criticizing myself as well um, but actually you know some of the work we're doing with visual methods um, and participatory methods just really is, is changing um, our understanding of, of some of the, the core issues we look at. Issues around power, um, for example, even in terms of things like impact, you know, what does impact look like for the community that we're working with? Um, and again, there are great examples of, of work like this happening, um, but I think the challenge now is to try and mainstream this so equity really does become a mainstream consideration within palliative care so i'm just gonna finish up now um, because i want to leave some time for questions um, but really as i said i'm arguing for a paradigm shift whereby equity is is seen as as our business by all of us not just those people who um, are working specifically in the equity space um, and that we need to start with ourselves. We need to start by making privilege visible, including in our research. Um, but, you know, there will be resistance. Um, and I'm sure many of you will have um, read books like White Fragility, will have thought about um, white responses to issues like Black Lives Matters. Um, and there will be difficult conversations potentially because, you know, we're not a well-resourced sector anyway and if we're talking about equity that can mean certain sectors losing resource you know what does that 
that mean both within research, but also for our services as well. Um, and I would say there might be a special kind of palliative care fragility as well. Certainly I've met um, quite a lot of resistance over the years to some of the things I've, I've said. Um, and really that's been in the form of denial. You know, I remember a woman saying to me when I was talking about um, palliative care and dementia, that hospices were not meeting the needs of people with dementia at, as, as they should, um, you know, really being attacked that they did a great level of care in their service. Um, so I think, you know, a huge part of this is, is getting over our discomfort um, with feeling like we're not doing as well as we should be, because we're not, you know, we know the inequities are there. Um, this is just what I've learned about being an ally, because I think moving palliative care into a situation where equity becomes a mainstream concern, a lot of that will mean that we have to learn how to be good allies. And the first um, aspect of that is actually knowing when to shut up and when not to take up space, um, when not to sit on panels, when not to give presentations, because we are not the right people to be doing that. Um, but there are also times when we have to stand up and say the difficult things, um, because some things it's easier for us to say. Um, and critically, I think um, I'm aware that my Māori colleagues and I'm sure lots of um, people who are um, identify with minoritized groups who are working in the equity space face a huge burden of work around this in terms of, you know, people asking to be educated, people asking um, to join their research projects and, and to do all this work around equity. And I think it's really important that, that we recognize that. And again, we realize that the responsibility lies, lies with us. And ultimately we will all benefit. So I just wanted to finish um, with a story that's not about um, palliative care. It's actually about a tanifa or a, a sea monster. Um, and it's a story that's um, been talked about by Dr. Dan Hikora from the University of Auckland. And there was a flood in Matamata um, in the Bay of Plenty um, not so long ago. And the only buildings that remained unscathed pretty much were three marae. And what was really interesting was that the marae weren't built um, in areas prone to flooding because of an ancient tale about a tanifa um, that flicked its tail. Um, and Dan talks about how, you know, ancient knowledge and wisdom was actually contained within that story, within that parako, um, but that that was dismissed by Westerners, you know, Western ways of seeing the world because it was not expressed in a way that was seen to be scientific. Um, and I think, you know, one of the most rewarding aspects of my career has been having the privilege to learn about different ways of seeing the world, both with Māori, but also with a lot of other groups um, that I've worked with over the years. And really, that's where I'd like to end by acknowledging um, the work of, of others, um, the researchers that I work with, um, and our participants as well. Um, and just to say, you know, this was meant to be a bit of a provocative um, sort of where to from here. I'm not claiming I'm an expert in this space at all. I'm very much learning, but I just wanted to share some of the things that I've learned so far. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Merrin. Um, I think before we move on to questions, um, did you want to stop sharing your screen for a moment? Um, there we go. Uh, and if everyone is comfortable to uh, sort of show their cameras and unmute so that maybe we can show our appreciation for Merrin. Thank you, Merrin. That was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's so nice to see everybody pop up. Um, I think if anyone has any questions, then do feel free to either write them in the chat box and I can read somebody's name out. Or if anyone wants to put their hand up and ask their question directly. Relaxing after I've been at work all day. <laughs> so were there any questions from anybody regarding the presentation i'm really sorry i can't find my hand up button can i just speak yeah go for it just a yeah hands up it's terribly badly 
prepared. I can't find where the hand is. But anyway, thank you so much, Marin. Brilliant, very interesting talk. Kept me completely um, uh, glued to the screen. So thank you so much. Um, I suppose you've laid out the problem really well. Um, and you've talked a little bit about some of the things that we could do to improve things. It, uh, do you think there's any low hanging fruit, if I can coin an expression? Is there anything that you think that hospice services or palliative care services could do uh, fairly painlessly that would make their services more uh, equitable? Um, I think listen. So I think actually listen to the people who should be using the service. Um, in terms of services, I would, yeah, it sounds a bit simplistic, but often I think there's consultation, but there's not genuine listening and there can be a level of defensiveness around um, what, what has been found. Um, I think, you know, thinking more about research, um, things like um, we're thinking about trying to develop some sort of equity checklist to support us when we publish in terms of, you know, are we actually um, really, you know, prompting us to, to think about all the things we should be thinking about. And we've, um, we've done one around gender, um, but, but, you know, actually getting journals to, to adopt that sort of thing. Um, and something we do in New Zealand around um, equity in our grant applications is that we have to talk about how the research will, um, promote the interests of Māori. And we also now have an equity space where we can talk about um, things like disability, um, other equity dimensions um, as well. So I think, you know, actually, we actually have to mainstream these things and we actually have to build them into our systems. And I'm sure there are equivalents in terms of service provision. Um, it's not really my area, so I can't speak um, to that, that more specifically, but certainly in terms of thinking about how services are commissioned, you know, having equity as a central concern has to be a priority moving forward. I don't think we can carry on with an inequitable status quo. Thank you. I think we've just had a question from Jenny Baxley, Lee. Jenny, did you want to, to talk? Sure. Um, my question is, um, I'm really grateful, Marin, for the information. I'm at the University of Florida and really looking at equity and anti-racist practice in the curriculum. My question, so I appreciated the shift in language from cultural competency to cultural safety, but I'm interested to know what language you are finding is useful to describe equity in healthcare practice or healthcare education. And what are your thoughts on the term culturally responsive practice or is there other language you would direct us toward? Um, well, the paper I cited was written by um, some Maori medical colleagues in New Zealand and that was really around um, what language we should be using in, in health practice and, include, and in education. So they're really advocating um, a move towards cultural safety um, because as I said, and, and as you reflected, you know, that, that puts the onus back on to us. Um, and we move beyond a space where I think we've been, where we've been learning about the cultures of other people. Um, I mean, cultural responsiveness is a term that we do use, but really cultural safety is the one that's being advocated. So I think the slides are all gonna be up um, on the website and there's a reference there. So I would really um, sort of urge you to have a read of that because it's a really interesting analysis of how those terms have been used and how you know terminology is shifting and then some recommendations to move us forward specifically within healthcare education and practice. Thank you so much, so helpful. Um, I think we've probably got time for one more question before we end the, the seminar. If anyone has a burning question they'd like to, to ask. Um, I have one. Um, yes, who's who is that? Um, Cynthia, um, thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, this is something that definitely I think um, hits to me personally in my heart, so I really appreciate it. Um, my question surrounds diversity in the workforce and if that might play a huge part in this cultural, maybe competence, safety, whatever word we want to you know, use it. 
because um, and also systemic barriers around diversity in the workforce. If you can speak to that and maybe um, how that might play a part in um, accessibility and you know maybe underutilization of services around, um, among under minoritized groups per se. Thanks, Cynthia, because that was actually something I meant to talk about and I didn't. So um, I think the composition of our workforce is really important. I think it's absolutely critical. Um, and one thing that, you know, we reflect in, for example, on the discussion paper around poverty and deprivation that we've just written is, you, you know, how many of our health professionals have actually um, not only just come from that background, but are able to bring that experience into their education, into their work. Um, and reflecting on what we're trying to do at the School of Nursing um, in Auckland is to really try and make it a safer space for Māori students in particular, acknowledging that actually nursing has had a huge role to play in colonialism and that Māori haven't wanted to come and study with us. And again, you know, that's, that started with us. So we do tikanga every morning, which means we're learning waiata, um, thanks to an amazing, um, woman via Erin Paulson, who is kind of supporting us with that. Um, but yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The workplace, you know, who makes up our workforce and within that, who gets promoted and who has positions of power within our workforce, force, both our clinical workforce and our research workforce is absolutely critical. Thank you. Uh, that's great. We have had a couple of more questions, but it is getting quite late now. So I think we'll wrap it up there and just say thank you again, Merrin, for such a thought provoking and brilliant presentation at 5.30 in the morning as well. Um, <laughs> thank you. Very uh, and I, thank you. Um, yeah. And I just wanted to remind everyone that we have the next seminar coming up in autumn time. So keep an eye out for that. And if you want CPD to contact Yana as usual. So see you next time. And thanks again, Merrin. Welcome. Really, really great to have you, Merrin. Thank Very you. Good. Coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Nikki, for organising. Very good.